Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and I'm feeling downbeat this morning, as I'm sure most Arsenal fans are. Arsenal, of course, surrendering a two-goal lead at Vicarage Road against bottom of the table Watford, uh, who probably in truth should have gone on and won the game in the end. That's how bad Arsenal's second half performance was. Now, um, on this episode, I'm going to be taking you through the game. I'm going to be sharing my thoughts. I want to hear your thoughts, of course, in the comments section too. And I'll be giving you details on our fans phone in and about how you can get in touch and have your say on the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. So uh, lots to talk about and uh, let's get straight into it. Now, I'm going to start off with Unai Emery's team selection. Now, if I show you the team that I picked, uh, which I said was partly what I would have done and partly what I thought Unai was going to do. Um, in terms of personnel, the only player that I got wrong was Alexander Lacazette. Now, that's because when I recorded it, the, the news hadn't come out yet that Lacazette would, of course, be missing until October. So, uh, you know, we found that out after. And, of course, Mesut Ozil came in uh, to replace him. But other than that, the, the rest of the 10 was spot on. Now, in terms of the system, I must admit, I didn't think that Unai was going to go with the diamond. I think the fact that Lacazette was out injured probably forced his hand into that and probably made him feel that that was the more suitable system to go with. Um, for me, it, it didn't really work. And I know we were 2-0 up at half time, and I'm going to come on to the positives because there were a few in the first half um, in a moment. But in terms of the diamond formation, I think that the diamond formation, you know, I spoke on a, on a video on a podcast last week about how I felt that Granit Xhaka was constantly exposed. Uh, and not just Granit Xhaka, whoever plays at the foot of that Arsenal midfield gets exposed by our tactics, by the way that we're so open, by the way we're so slow in the transition. And I think that that's amplified and made even worse when you only have one player at the foot of a diamond. And when that player is Granit Xhaka, a player who we're always talking about um, in regards to his lack of mobility and, and various other things, it's very difficult to understand why Unai Emery goes with that system, why he goes with that diamond. He'd done it at Liverpool um, and it didn't really work, but it was hard to judge it that day because Liverpool at Anfield are a completely different animal to most of the teams that you're going to come up against in this Premier League. So I wasn't too, too fussed about the fact that he tried it there. Um you know, I, I didn't really agree with it. I thought Arsenal should have played more to their strengths and been a little bit more attacking. But I kind of got why he did it. I don't get, though, why he did it uh, at Vicarage Road. Now, Arsenal started the game pretty well in in the sense that, you know, we were still giving up a lot of possession. We were still giving Watford chances, half chances, shots from the edge of the box. And, you know, Watford had an incredible amount of shots uh, in yesterday's game. We'll come on to touch on that a little bit later on. But... In terms of the first half, the, the, the few positives that there were, say Kalasinac for me, um, horrendous defender. I think we can all agree on that. He's not uh, positionally uh, good defensively and he's not uh, somebody that you can necessarily rely on to, to protect uh, that flank. But what he does do is he gives you a drive in that attacking half and he showed that because there was an incident where Danny Ceballos made a tackle. Watford, of course, wanted a foul. But say Kalasinac, if when he picks the ball up, he's got one thing in his mind and that one thing is to get his head down and drive at Watford drive right at the heart of them and he ended up putting uh, a ball across to Aubameyang who took one touch and on the turn finished brilliantly Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang probably the only positive the only Arsenal player that can come out of that game with his head held high because he'd done his job didn't he he scored two goals away from home as a striker what more can you ask from him so Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang Probably one of the only positives. And then the second goal, you know, Arsenal again carving Watford open. And and at this point, you think that Watford are a side very low on confidence. Yes, Kike Sanchez Flores has come in. It's a new manager. There's a new bounce there. But you feel like Arsenal at this point have really put Watford to the sword. And from there on in, you know, from a Watford perspective, you're probably fearing that this could end up being a 4 5 nil route. Um, but that wasn't the case, as we're going to come on to in a moment. But you know, I thought that when Arsenal carved Watford open for that second goal, I thought that we saw what you get out of Mesut Ozil in that final third. Now, people would talk about his work rate, etc., etc., and that's a whole other issue. Um, 
which I'm not going to get into now. But in terms of what Mesut Ozil does is he has that vision and he's able to pick a pass with the correct weight on it and essentially open up Watford. And that's what he did. And he receives the ball. And if you have a look at it again, when Mesut Ozil receives the ball, another player probably takes another touch, delays it that little bit. And then maybe Ainsley Maitland-Niles just drifts offside. But what Ozil does is he doesn't wait to set his body. He spots the pass and immediately with the outside of his boot, he plays the pass through perfectly weighted. And that, uh, you know, incisiveness that, you know, the fact that he doesn't hesitate, I should say, is what makes that opening. It's because the timing is perfect. And that's what Mesut Ozil brings to the side. Plays Ainsley Maitland-Niles in, who's, who's got a simple ball to play across the box. Um, and there is Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang to tap it in and double Arsenal's lead. And at this point, you're thinking, great, we're away from home. We're 2-0 up. You acknowledge that, you know, we're not exactly watertight defensively. You can see that Watford are still having chances, still having shots, etc., etc., but it was very difficult to be too negative at half time when we were tuning up and things were seemingly going our way. But Leno made a couple of good saves, etc. But overall, uh, you know, it was a pretty positive half. But what was to follow in the second half was completely unacceptable, totally unacceptable. And there are lots and lots of questions being asked to the manager in the aftermath of this defeat. And rightly so. These are questions that I've been asking for six months about this manager. Six months. And I've taken dog's abuse from people on this podcast, from people on Arsenal Fan TV, from people on various other shows on the same old Arsenal, telling me that I'm negative against Unai Emery, that I don't want him to succeed in the first place. That is not the case whatsoever. The simple fact is that these issues that are causing us problems at the moment have been there from the very start of Unai Emery's tenure. And at the beginning, we all gave him the benefit of the doubt. We all said he hasn't got his players. He hasn't got his players. But the two centre-halves yesterday were two players that were brought in under Unai Emery's watch. Now, if you want to talk about Raul maybe picking the players, if you want to talk about Edu now having a say on who comes in, who goes out, maybe you've got a point. But the fact is, these are players that have brought, been brought in under Unai Emery's tenure. So if he doesn't want them and he can't get the best out of them, then there's something fundamentally wrong with the entire structure at the club. But Unai Emery has the tools there to be better than we currently are, to be stronger defensively than we currently are. In my view, there is no excuse uh, for what went on in that second half. And, uh, you know, let's let's dive into that half now. We'll go through it bit by bit. We'll talk about the incidents and we'll talk about uh, various other points too. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening via iTunes or any other audio platform, please, please do leave us a review. It is hugely appreciated. Now, in terms of, of the second half, Watford never looked out of it because, of course, Arsenal are so poor defensively, are so slow to get back into shape uh, on the transition. And, you know, we know that there's individual mistakes all over this team. We all know that. There's no getting away from that point, is there? But for me, of course, well, and, and for everyone, I'm sure the catalyst for Watford's comeback was, of course, the, the first goal. And Socrates' is stupid, stupid error where he passes the ball straight to the striker, who lays it inside and Tom Cleverley's there to smash it in. And Watford, all of a sudden, back in the game, bit between their teeth. They're well up for it. New manager bounce, kicks in full flow. And you're thinking, shit, we're in trouble here. And, you know, people will sit there and slag off Socrates and say, how has he done that? Why has he not played it long? Why has he not done this? Why has he not done that? And I completely agree that he's totally in the wrong. And that is a stupid error for a player of his experience to make. It's, it's totally unacceptable. But errors happen. And I remember watching Manchester City the day before uh, away to Norwich and looking at the way that Otamendi and Stones played themselves into trouble, which led to Norwich's third goal, and thinking to myself, how stupid have you got to be to play that way? But that's that, That's what Pep Guardiola wants, but Pep Guardiola has the players to do it. And yes, at times it will go wrong, like it did for Manchester City at Norwich. But overall, when you look at Pep Guardiola's football, there are more benefits to it 
than than problems you know and and Norwich you know they were clever they stayed on it they they put them under pressure they knew that City were lacking Laporte who's been a fantastic centre-half for them and they really applied the pressure on Otamendi and Stones and in the end they got their reward but I remember thinking to myself why hasn't Otamendi just used his head and played that long and I, I guess the same thing applies with Socrates here now what I will say in Socrates' defence, and it's not a defence because I think that, you know, it wasn't his fault. It, of course, it's partly and mostly his fault. But the fact that we've been doing this time and time again, calling our centre-backs to the edge of our six-yard box to receive the ball, and we've put ourselves in so many dodgy situations, you've got to question why we keep persisting with this absolute nonsensical way of playing out from the back. It makes no fucking sense. Excuse my language, but it makes no fucking sense. And that goal that we conceded at Watford is a disaster that's been waiting to happen for weeks. If you cast your mind back to last season, we were doing it at the start of the season, putting ourselves under lots of pressure. One example I can remember off the top of my head was when Petr Cech played it to Harry Arter at Cardiff. That was really early on in the season. And we were fortunate that they never took the chance and they never punished us. But it happened time and time again. And at what point as a manager, as Unai Emery, do you say, abandon that, scrap that, or give the players the authority to do what they see fit? Jens Lehmann always says it. You play the game to the circumstances. You don't let the game play you, if, if that makes sense. And, it, you know, it, it's, it's an, there's no excuse for it. Socrates should clear it. If he's not going to clear it, he's got to make a better pass. But that is a result of Unai Emery's insistence on playing out from the back. And it's bitten us in the arse. And I can guarantee you that if we carry on doing it and we carry on sticking to that principle, it will bite us in the arse again and again and again because we don't have the quality to do it. Now, I was watching Match of the Day last night and Martin Keown made a really, really good point. If you're going to go long, it's not as simple as saying... Here you go. Let's play it out short to Socrates and then Socrates going long without sort of the team being set up for that. Because then what you have is you have a gap between your back line and the midfield and the front line, which is far too big, which creates holes and spaces for your opponent to exploit anyway. And, you know, when you do go long, a lot of the time it's a 50 50. There's going to be a challenge aerially for it. And often, you know, you can lose the ball. So having that, that setup where your defence are so deep and then your midfielder pushed high up because you've decided last minute to go long creates problems of its own. It creates gaps and that's a problem too. But I've watched Socrates for years playing for the Greek national team and I've always said that he's not a great defender and that he's not very comfortable on the ball and he's got lots and lots of faults. But that is not Socrates. That is not his ideology. That is not his philosophy. That's not how he believes the game of football should be played. That is something that Unai Emery is persisting with. And it's a real fucking problem. And it cost us yesterday. Time and time again, we saw Matteo Genduzzi be the one to drop from the midfield and receive the ball off the back line. Now, you could argue that Granit Xhaka was playing at the foot of the, the diamond. But the problem is that Watford knew that. And Watford were always going to close that option down time and time again. So Genduzzi took it upon himself to drop deep and win the ball um, and collect the ball. But if you're going to get the ball there, you can't dilly-dally on it. And he'd done it again and again and again. And he got caught out time and time again. And fortunately for us, you know, that particular sort of pattern of play wasn't punished. But... How many times is he going to drop deep, receive the ball and take three, four, five touches too many before he releases it? You come, you get it, you give it back. You come, you get it, you play it wide. That's what he's got to be looking to do. It's got to be quicker. You cannot be standing on the ball for as long as Matteo Genduzzi does in those areas of the pitch because as, as good as he may be at shielding the ball, as tenacious as he may be, there are going to be times where he gets un outnumbered. He's got his back to, to his opponent. He's going to get caught by surprise. He's going to get caught out. And that is a real issue as well. But again, this comes because Arsenal don't have a plan B. It's always that same fucking pattern of play. Out to the, to the centre-half, into that midfield, always looking. We don't seem to have that option of going wide often enough. It's always through the middle. Always that same pattern of play. And teams have cottoned onto it. You only need to watch Arsenal for a half to know what it is they're going to do and what they want to do. And and 
to be able to expose it. Uh, while we're on the subject of Matteo Genduzzi, he was substituted by... He was on a yellow card, treading thin ice. You know he's the type of player whose emotions can boil over, who can get himself sent off. He walks off the pitch, gets a bit of stick from the Watford fans and makes a 2-1 gesture like this. Now, that game wasn't done and dusted it is we're not in a comfortable position that is an incredible show of confidence from a young man to do that because he's going to take lots and lots of stick for that now and rightly so premature immature stupid and has made us a laughing stock and made himself a laughing stock now there, there are things i like about genduzi and i was full of praise for him after the north london derby i liked that you know, when Pepe got involved with Jolevas in that little that little spat, that little incident, I liked that Genduzi was the first man over. I liked that he stuck up for his teammate. I liked the passion. I liked the the fight that he shows. But he's got to learn to control that. And and it's the same thing, isn't it? That that passion boiling over and leading him to do stupid things. Could have got himself in trouble in that little incident. Fortunately, he didn't. It was a bit of handbag. So, you know, if anyone had got sent off there, I'd have been very, very surprised. But for me, you know, as promising as he is, he's got to learn to curb that passion and turn that into positive energy in terms of what he does on the ball and on the pitch and not get so over-concerned with all the nonsense. And he... I've said that about him last season, that he gets too concerned about stupid things. And, you know, it often it takes over and he sees red and it affects his game because he gets involved in all of that. And then you've got the second goal. David Lewis with another absolute fucking moment of madness. But again, you can sit, you can slag off David Lewis for dangling out a leg. And I was having a conversation with a friend earlier and we were saying that, you know, there isn't, a great deal of contact there. David Lewis hasn't really made a challenge, but the fact that he's dangled his leg out, the fact that you're just inside the penalty area, you're giving the 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 referee, sorry, a decision to make. And he made it. And you can't really argue with it. It is a foul. It is a penalty. If it was the other way around, we'd have been going absolutely ape shit about it. But that all stems from again the team setup, the team formation, Unai Emery's philosophy. He's made the changes that he's made. He's taken off Danny Ceballos, a player capable of holding the ball, a player capable of making a pass, a player with, you know, you know, I, I don't know what Unai Emery's excuse was. He said he was too hot or something. What was that about? And I know things get lost in translation with Unai Emery and you can't always uh, take his words as gospel because English isn't his first language. He's still learning, etc. I get that. But for me, that change made no sense. He took Mesut Ozil off, which I kind of get because Ozil, that was his first game of the season. The fitness levels may not necessarily be where you want them to be. But you can't take off Ozil and Ceballos because then you've got no ball player in the middle of the park. You've got no creativity. You've got no ability. And if things do go south like they did, there's no way of recovering. There's no way of turning it on again once Watford have got the upper hand and, and starting to dominate possession and settling down and saying, right, We've given you a bit of a period here, but now it's time for us to step it up a gear, get on the ball, dictate the play and get back on top. You couldn't do that with the players that Unai Emery brought on. You couldn't do that with the changes that Unai Emery made. And, you know, I want to know, and the question I want to know is you bring Lucas Torreira on and, and most Arsenal fans are sitting there thinking, OK, I get that. You've brought Lucas Torreira on because you feel that he can solid up that midfield a bit, that he can shore us up a little bit and that he will protect us a little bit more defensively than a Sobias would or an Ozil would, and I get that. But to be in a situation where Lucas Torreira is having a shot on the edge of their box when you're 2-1 up with 10 minutes to go is absolutely stupid. It's stupid on the player's part to not have that awareness around him of what's going on. And the awareness of where we are in the game, where we are in terms of the time left on the clock and handle it properly and be sensible. And it's stupid on Unai Emery's point not to be instructing those players and making sure that they're doing those jobs. If you haven't told him before he's gone on the pitch, I want you to sit in front of the back four. What the fuck have you brought him on for? Because he's on the edge of their box trying to score a goal. And before you know it, I think it was three, four passes maybe later. Watford are on the edge of our penalty area winning a penalty 
because our midfield were complete were caught totally out of position and as bad as David Lewis is and as stupid as David Lewis was to make that challenge the fact is that Watford had a free run on our back four and you isolate a back four more often than not you're going to cause them problems we're not talking about a Virgil van Dijk here who's going to win the challenge who's going to take the man at all costs who's going to do it outside the box before he even gets in there we're talking about David Lewis a player who when isolated can be gotten at and we all knew that when we signed him it's no secret but again, I would question why on earth we've committed so many men forward with 10 minutes to go 2-1 up away from home. I guess I've gotten to the point where I think it, it doesn't necessarily matter who Arsenal bring in because tactically we're all over the place. We, we haven't settled on a system and I, I, I've got no problem with being flexible. But it feels like we don't even have a... You, you need to have a plan A. To be able to have a plan B and C, I guess is my point. You need to know what plan A is first. And we don't even have a plan A at the minute. From week to week, things are changing. Players are making individual mistakes, yet they're still getting selected uh, time and time again. To an extent, Unai Emery's hands are tied with some injuries in certain positions. But when you're talking about players that Unai Emery's brought in, and the fact that they're not good enough, then it, it ultimately, it doesn't matter what way around you look at it. You, when you go around the circle, you come back to an Emery and the team that are bringing in these players. And they have to take some responsibility. Now, lots of people are fed up of Granite Xhaka. I didn't think for what it's worth that he was our worst player yesterday. Uh, there was a lot of poor performances in that side. I didn't think he was great either, but I I I don't think that people should be sitting there pointing the finger at him. I didn't think the system, the shape helped him in any way whatsoever. Um, and I fully expect that this week Granit Xhaka will be named as the Arsenal captain. And then I'll come back to a point I've made before. If you're so anti Granit Xhaka, then you've got to criticise the manager. Because why is the manager picking him every week? Why is the manager about to name this guy as the Arsenal captain if he's that bad? So surely... If you ask questions of Granit Xhaka, you need to ask questions of Unai Emery too. Now, you can quite easily ask questions of a manager without being a, an arsehole, without going to the stadium with an Emery out banner, without being toxic, as some people like to call it. That, that term was banded around about Arsenal fans a lot, particularly during the end of Wenger's tenure. But you can ask questions. And you should ask questions as a fan. We're a club with extremely high standards. We need to be at the top. We, we should be at the top. That's where Arsenal Football Club belongs. Uh, and right now we're finding ourselves in a position where the, finishing in the top four is, is huge for us. That's how far we've fallen. And, you know, despite all of this, Arsenal may well finish in the top four purely because when you look at the sides around us, they're, they're in disarray. You know, Tottenham were supposedly in a crisis. Well, you know, we're level on points with them. Uh, Manchester United are supposed to be in crisis. We're level on points with them too. Chelsea have a very young side, but it seems like you're starting to see signs that Frank Lampard is starting to implement what he wants. So again, it, I guess the point is for those sides, you can only assume that they're going to get better. They can't get any worse. But with Arsenal, we're, we're, we've been the same at the same level for far too long now and things are not improving. And, you know, ultimately people will blame this player, they'll blame that player, they'll talk about this circumstance, they'll talk about Arsene Wenger even. But Unai Emery was brought in to improve things and that improvement has not come about, in my opinion. So, for that reason, um, you know, you've got to ask those questions. Now, Granit Xhaka came out after the game and he spoke to the press uh, as the captain. I guess he's going to be doing that more and more. And he said that Arsenal was scared in the second half. And I've seen lots and lots of reaction to that. How the fuck can our captain say we were scared? How can he say this? How can he say that? He's being honest. He's being honest, to put it quite frankly. Granit Xhaka has been honest about, um, you know, what was going on sort of mentally within the group. Granit Xhaka, you know, on the other hand, you, you maybe shouldn't take his words at face value all the time because a bit like Emery and I know Xhaka's English is a lot better than Emery's but again you're talking about someone who English isn't their first language and perhaps he hasn't put the right uh, word across in terms of trying to portray what he's what he's feeling or what he wanted to say and, and you know often journalists and, and various other people will hang on to words 
and make a story around some words. And you could take that, you know, with what Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang said to the French press after where he said, it feels like we're gifting goals to the opposition. But he also goes on to say that you can't really blame any one individual because you could argue that as strikers, we should have put the game to bed at 2-0. But they don't report that part. That part doesn't get reported. You'll only see the, 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 the headline, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, Arsenal give goals away. It feels like we're giving goals away. And, and that's, you know, it's important to take things in context, to sit down and calm down. And I wanted to record, I, well, my plans were that I was going to record this podcast last night. But I didn't do it. And I didn't do it because I wanted to watch the game again. I wanted to be calmer when I was talking about it because I felt that I could better uh, make some sensible points sort of after the event rather than directly after the event. But for me, there's still far too many problems. The right back position is very, very problematic. People talk about Bellerin coming back soon. Great news. But he's not going to make us defensively watertight. It's not going to make that much of a difference in terms of our defence. He might give us more Going forward, he might give us more energy on the right-hand side. Great. But Hector Bellerin's going to take some time to get back to his best. Um, it's quite clear that at the moment, opponents are identifying that Maitland-Niles position as a problem for us. And that's an area that Arsenal probably should have addressed in the summer, and they didn't. Um, Spurs exposed that position. Watford, through Gerard Delafeu, exposed that position. He was running rings around Maitland-Niles all, all afternoon. Um all day uh, you know you could talk about positions that should have been addressed in the summer that weren't you, you can talk about the fact that we spent 72 million pounds or by the time we've paid for him it would have been 72 million pounds on Nicola Pepe I know it's very early days in his Arsenal career but I have to say I'm concerned by what I've seen what I see is a very raw talent uh, a player with um, lots of pace lots of power some trickery but maybe the end product isn't always necessarily there do I have faith in Unai Emery's ability to coach him and get the best out of him? No, I don't. And and you, this is going to cause some uproar. Of course, people are going to start on me about this. But I honestly believe that he had developed better under Arsene Wenger. Because for all Arsene Wenger's problems, in terms of developing attacking talent, he was very good at that. And you, you can't deny that. Maybe towards the last... Uh, two or three seasons that sort of dropped off a little bit too but in terms of his overall profile as a manager he was very very good at taking that raw talent and developing it and I feel that Nicola Pepe you know feels the pressure because of the price tag that was uh, attached to him this summer but also I don't think he's necessarily going to get the coaching he needs to fulfill his potential and in that case he probably could have spent that 72 million pounds on somebody else on on a position that was maybe more problematic for us. Now I'm going to bring up some statistics that are really really concerning and and, and you know I'm going to bring them up on your screen now. Defensive woes under Emery and these were highlighted on match of the day two last night. Uh, Arsenal have conceded 14 goals from direct errors um, and from penalties. Arsenal have conceded 10 goals and both of those are the most in the Premier League. So Arsenal conceded 14 goals from errors. That's more than Fulham, more than Bournemouth, more than Southampton, more than Huddersfield uh, since Unai Emery's taken over. And in terms of penalties conceded, it's the most in the league. Again, Brighton level with us on 10, Huddersfield 7, Leicester 6, Manchester United 6, Newcastle United 6. That's Premier League since August 2018. So since Unai Emery took over. And also, we've got the most shots conceded. You know, Premier League goal, uh, Premier League shots conceded this season. Four games played, Arsenal have conceded ninety six shots at goal. Norwich ninety three, Tottenham eighty two, Villa seventy seven, Bournemouth seventy six. Now that is worrying, and what that suggests is that it's not just down to, uh, you know, what. Well, of course, the individual errors play a part. They do. And, and you've seen in that other stat that, you know, we've conceded the most goals from them, 14. But it also proves that as a team, we are not defensively set up right. We are not defensively drilled right. We're not getting things right in terms of our tactics. And and, and these thoughts, uh, these things cannot be ignored. Sorry. Um, I did make some notes after the game yesterday, some little points that I wanted to raise. I'm just going to quickly have a look. Um at those just to make sure I haven't missed anything off. I, I don't think I have. I think with sort of there or thereabouts in terms of having covered all my thoughts. 
Um, but I want to leave you guys with a final thought. And that final thought is I want you guys to sit down, take five minutes out of your day, sit down and think about all the reasons that you hounded out Arsene Wenger. All the reasons. Now, I'm not for a minute saying that Arsene Wenger should have stayed. I thought it was time for him to go as well. But think of all the reasons you hounded him out. Fast forward to now and think about what's changed. And the answer is absolutely fucking nothing. So it just goes to show that, you know, Unai Emery is not the right man for the job. And I'll say it again. I've been saying it for months. Taking abuse for it. And I don't care. Even if we finish in the top four and we scrape there, we get there by hook or by crook because the teams around us are just as bad. I still don't want him at the club because I haven't seen what I wanted to see from a new manager. You, We moved Arsene Wenger on for these reasons. Yet these reasons, these problems are still there a year down the line. And I'd imagine, and I'm going to stick my neck out on the line, I'll say by the end of this season, we'll still be seeing those same problems. Because for me, Unai Emery hasn't got it. He's not good enough. And it's time to cut our losses. Um, you know, there's not much value in, in changing now. But if by January things haven't improved, then for me, you cut your losses, you get Unai Emery out, you bring someone else in, give them six months to embed their philosophy, and then give them uh, you know, a fresh start with a bit of backing in the summer. Just my thoughts on it at the moment. And uh, those have been my thoughts for a while. So I'm sticking to them. And it's nice. To, it's not nice to see because, um, you know, I want Arsenal to do well, as does anybody else. But people are finally starting to wake up to it. Um, I had a number of tweets yesterday from people saying, apologies that I doubted you when you questioned Emery. Apologies that I gave you you stick when you criticised him. Well, maybe now you'll see that the reasons I criticised Dunai Emery and the things that I've pointed out are still an issue. And if you can't see that, then I'm sorry, you're, you, you, you're being blind to the whole situation. Unai Emery doesn't have credit in the bank with the Arsenal fans. Unai Emery is not a club legend. Unai Emery doesn't deserve to have credit in the bank based on what he's done so far. And the progress has been very little and it's very, very worrying. And it's Aston Villa next at home. We should win that. I expect us to win that. But then it's Manchester United away. And I expect that the same issues will occur there. And we'll be talking about all the same things that we're talking about today. And it's getting boring because we're just repeating ourselves time and time again. A big thank you to every single one of you who's watched, listened. Uh, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe button, please. Leave us your thoughts in the comments too. I like to read you guys' comments. I'll reply to as many as I possibly can. Uh, fans phoning coming up this week too. Stick to uh, our Twitter feed at Chronicles underscore AFC for more information on that. And if you fancy it... Uh, you can get yourselves one of these Chronicles AFC uh, T-shirts. We are going to be giving one away to the best caller on this week's fans phone in. Uh, it will be voted for by you guys, the listeners. Best caller will receive one in the post. And alternatively, if you want to purchase one, uh, you can DM us at Chronicles underscore AFC. They're going out at cost price. We're just trying to get the name out there. Um, so there's no profit on them. The postage is free. It's on us, etc. Um so, yeah, if you're interested, at Chronicles underscore AFC, DM me. Until next time, take care of yourselves and we'll be back very, very soon with some more Arsenal content. Up the Gunners. <laughs>